Hello again, welcome back to another day of daily Bible study. We're doing it on with the first letter of John. We're going to start chapter 3 today, do about half the chapter. Before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, uh, when we read John, and it is so easy to think we know what he's talking about and then stop reading and then imagine we've got it all figured out. But Lord, you remind us that when we read all of what John has to say, uh, Lord, he is putting a big challenge to us. So Lord, let us be encouraged by the parts that are encouraging and let us be challenged by the parts that are challenging and let us keep them both together as John does and as you do throughout your word. Lord, watch over us as we spend this time together. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, John was talking before, but he says, if you know, the, the last verse of the last chapter was, you, uh, if you know that he, Jesus, is righteous, you know that everyone who also who practices righteousness is born of him. He's going to say more things that will also give some flesh to that. This is what he writes in chapter 3. He says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as Christ, just as he is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So one of the things we read when we read John is that um, he talks about this idea of love. And there's a, if, we, if we read only snippets of John, we can uh, think we know the picture when we may not know all of it. So he talks about things like, you know, um, and he says here, you know, that, that anyone who does righteousness... Anyone who does righteous, who behaves in a righteous way, is born of God. But he doesn't just mean what the world counts as righteousness. He defines righteousness in terms of who Jesus is. You know, if we recognize that Jesus is the one who is righteous, if we recognize Jesus as the one who defines what righteousness is, then yes, the ones who also do the things that Jesus does, the one who also follows in the way of Jesus, they are the one who is righteous. And it's not a question about you know, what the rest of the world considers to be righteousness because we're, he doesn't say anybody who's able to recognize righteousness in the world knows that anybody who does something that's righteous is, is, is born of God. He says anybody who recognizes that Jesus is righteous will also recognize that those who practice the things that Jesus practices uh, are, they're also born of God. And so he talks about this, and he really lays this out. You know, John Wesley, I've said before, said if you boil down the gospel to just five chapters, you get the first letter of John. And one of the things that John, that John Wesley says uh, that is very radical, he has a sermon called The Great Privilege of Those Who Are Born of God. And he lays out his understanding of Christian perfection in the strongest, actually most intimidating terms. Um, he does not usually put it out quite so emphatically. Uh, and yet it's worth recognizing what he says, because he, what he's trying to do is give voice to what he reads in passages like this one, where John comes out and says, if you're born of God, you don't sin. You don't sin. And so John Wesley's trying to say, if you, we belong to Jesus, we don't sin. And therefore, you know, the question becomes, you know, how, you know uh, is it possible to lose our salvation? And you have conversations with people, at least I've had conversations with people, and some people say, oh, yeah, it's easy to lose your salvation. Some people say, oh, no, it's difficult to lose your salvation, and, um, you know, all the rest. And John Wesley, in this sermon looking at passages like this says, uh, Wesley argues, he says, you, if, what does John say? John says, um, uh, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. And he makes a comment here about um, no one who abides in him sins. Um, no one who see, sins has seen him or knows him. And so John Wesley argues, he says, according to that kind of thing, uh, that if you commit sin at all in that moment, you are not saved. And, um, and again, it's one of those things where people talk about, can you lose your salvation? And we've talked about over and over again, this idea of the notion of, of sin and salvation and righteousness having the two different senses of, are, are you in a state of grace right now in this moment? And all, or the question is, will you be saved in the end? And I think that a lot of the conversation that gets had among people 
puts those two together and intertwines them in a way that's not actually accurate to the scripture. Um, but regardless of exactly how we interpret this, what John lays out for us pretty seriously here is this idea of um, if we are belonging to God, then sin needs to have no part in our lives. This is in many ways parallel to what we read in, in, the, in Romans when Paul says that um, uh, you know, how can we who have died to sin continue to live in it? And so we have this idea that, uh, that, that if we belong to God, then sin no longer has any place. If we remain in God, then there's no place for sin to take root and grow into something. And I think that if we forget that, if we begin to excuse our, our continued ongoing sin as if it is not a, a, an actual problem in our lives, then it will tend to stunt our ability to grow in grace. And now there's one way you might interpret this, and I think it's wrong, and I'll tell you why, is that you might say, well, we're, we're talking about like a legal distinction, that if someone belongs to Jesus, then uh, whatever they're doing, it doesn't count, it's not being counted against them as sin. You know, so it's talking about if you believe, it was like with the one who is born of God, no one who is born of God practices sin, um, and those kinds of things, you might argue that, well, it's just that if you belong to Jesus and the things that you might consider to be sin are because they're coming from a place of love and care in Christ, then therefore it doesn't kind of sin. Well, that's not what he's saying. Uh, you have to remember, John is using Jesus as our yardstick. John is using Jesus as our rule. And things that are consonant with who Jesus is are righteousness, and things that are not consonant with Jesus are unrighteousness. So, so you might even say, even John Wesley would say that just because you're, you, if you've been perfected in love doesn't mean you'll never be misunderstood doesn't mean that someone won't ever misunderstand what you're doing and, and credit something, uh, credit evil motives to you, even if you don't have those evil motives. And just because you've been perfected in love, John Wesley says, doesn't mean you're not going to ever make mistakes. It doesn't mean you're not ever going to not know something. And you're not ever going to make you know, stumble. But this idea of not allowing the sin to grab a place in our heart and grow. And I think that if we too quickly brush this aside and say, oh, no, 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 I've been made new in Christ, then none of this really applies to me anymore, and we don't realize the fact that there's an ongoing battle, if we just give up the battle in the name of what we've already won, uh, then we are missing what John's saying here. Because John's saying here that if we are continuing in sin, we are basically saying we don't belong to Jesus. And the stakes could not be higher in this sense. So I, I, I don't know that I want to take things quite in the same direction that John Wesley does and basically say, if you have committed a sin in that moment, you are fundamentally out of a state of grace, and if you died in that moment, you would certainly be condemned. Wesley does not even usually talk that way. But I think that what I want to remember and what I want you to remember is that the, the New Testament is not soft on sin. The New Testament says if we are, if the only way we can have sin grow in our lives is if we are not abiding in Jesus. And if we're not abiding in Jesus, we're abiding somewhere else, and that's a problem. So we need to be the kind of people who really do find our identity, find our place, and remain in Christ. And if we do that, then there's not going to be any fertile soil for sin to take root. Um, and I think that's vitally important that we remember that whenever we say something like, like John says at the end of that last chapter, anyone who practices righteousness is born of God, that we don't say, oh, any, any random nice person out there is inherently uh, you know, a Christian. What we mean is as we, as we are the ones who practice and live out the life of Jesus in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are the people who are made new and born of God. And um, one of the more radical statements about what that means in the entire New Testament and one we have to at least remember uh, or else we might find ourselves stumbling in places we ought not to stumble. Well, that's all for today. Come back in tomorrow and we'll continue on with more of the first letter of John. Have a good day.